All right, we're turning our attention to hurling. I'm delighted to say Anthony Nash is back with us. Anthony, good afternoon, good evening to you. How are you? I'm great, Joe. How are you keeping? I'm very well. It's um, it's Congress weekend this weekend, and I just wanted to ask your opinion on one thing that has kind of bubbled up over the last while. Uh, we've been talking with Paul Bellew when he was the Galway Hurling Board Chairman and now he's the County Board Chairman and he was on with Richie again this week talking about the motion to allow Galway minors hurl in either Munster or Leinster. Leinster is obviously their pro, their uh, preferred option but because of the way Congress works they had to say either one. We don't know at, at the time of recording this whether or not it's going to get passed or not but um, what's your instinct about letting the Galway minors hurl outside of Connacht in the Championship? Oh yeah, I'd be all for it. Like you're trying to make the sport as strong as you possibly can, um, you know. Like we, we should be trying to make the the counties that were stronger before stronger again. Like, and if that's going to help Galway hurling, well, then 100 percent you should let it in because then you're making hurling in general better. Uh, I'd have no problem at all. Like Galway going into Leinster was a huge success for me anyway. Um, you know, rather than having sitting and waiting for whatever kind of team coming through to play their first game, it, it's been a success. Uh, you know, for me, I know originally, you know, you're talking about like it's not Galway aren't in Leinster, and that was the original argument. But like, you should be 100% lending all Galway teams participate in a provincial championship. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think back to it, there was a period where they couldn't have home games, and it was kind of like, well, that's not very fair. Yeah. Everybody else gets home games, but they don't. It's it's kind of it seems strange to me that it's taken so long because. The twenties, I think, have been in since um, the under twenties or under twenty ones, as they might have been in in twenty eighteen, and it just feels like there's some kind of weird blockage in the system where we can't just do the right thing for whatever reason. <laughs> Common sense will hopefully prevail. Like it's as simple as this: it they should be in. If they're in Leinster for senior twenty, then straight into Leinster for the for the minor as well. I don't understand what the difference between the age profiles and stuff like that. Like it, it might take a tweak at the championship, but you let that happen. Like 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 oh, my argument for over any years, any any time I spoke to someone, if it's better for the game, then let it happen. And this is obviously better for the game. Um, you know, Galway is obviously one of the pinnacle teams in in Ireland in all grades. So therefore, you shouldn't be trying to knock them down or knock them back in any way. You should be trying to encourage a team to get stronger and better because therefore it's going to develop the championship. Now, like we could go on into Cork 20s this year and lose to Galway. And, you know, you obviously don't want to lose to a team. But like, what's the point in trying to knock a county that's stronger hurling? Um, we're already struggling to keep as many teams as we can at the top table. So common sense will hopefully prevail. They'll be left in, yeah. Yeah, uh, fingers crossed. Um, and then I, as a, I was thinking about raising this, I did kind of wonder if uh, every every year around Congress, you kind of get your spidey senses tingling a little bit. Uh, having been <laughs> the subject of a couple of Congresses, I, I kind of forgot <laughs> that. It wasn't just one, it was a couple of them. Yeah, yeah. Look, I... I if it's for the better of the game then do it like but don't be searching for stuff you know what I mean like for me at the moment we should be trying to get the likes of Offaly uh, the likes of Leash you know and from all these boys really at the top table and competing like to make the championship even more competitive they should be our first and foremost you know what I mean um, and then look if rules will change like I know like you know we're looking we're, the, the main conversation over the league last year is refereeing this that and the other but the hand pass and all this kind of stuff like and introducing this rule and that rule if it's better for the game then of course 100% but don't be searching for stuff that we don't need the game's in a good place as it is you know excitement and everything like that but um, so hopefully yeah there's always something thrown out like you know that you're kind of worried about but hopefully this year no, it'll be uh, it'll be just help to improve the game Did you ever go to Congress as a matter of interest when they were did, oh. did you show up were you ever tempted to show up and oh. go oh, did, did someone mention my name no, no, no. I, I stayed so far out of it because at the time, um, you know, look, I suppose Jimmy was in charge and we we're just trying to keep uh, keep our head down. We were fortunate enough to have Patrick Horgan in a situation that he could score penalties anyway. And uh, my age, I was getting a little bit older, which meant getting back from the goal was probably going to be a bit harder anyway. Um, but no, I never got involved in anything like that. Look, there's no point. You have no power. Like, if they make a decision, um, the only thing I was involved in was... We went to Turles, all right, to try and work out what would be the best solution. But going down there, we had a feeling as players that uh, they already had decided it was going to be one on one. And we partook, we gave our opinion, but uh, it was it was one on one penalties coming in. So sometimes you're wondering, like, are these decisions already made? What was in um, Turles? Sorry, what, what were you, was that like we, some, some kind of symposium? Yeah. So basically, yeah, there was a couple of people. I think Liam Sheedy was there and a <clears throat> couple of goalkeepers, a couple of forwards, penalty takers from counties, and we were asked to trial different types of penalties um, you know and didn't say which was the best one and whatever like that but uh, you know it had been touted about for years before that that a one on one penalty was hoped to be brought in um, and then all of a sudden when the rule change came in sure it was an inevitability that it was going to come in but uh, so we were down there for a day um, to try and just show and gave our opinions on it and uh, came away and it was the one on one penalty then after that no not, it wasn't that we were all fully against it 
we we kind of thought I think Joe Canning was there and Colm Callanan from Galway and um, we kind of spoke about what could the alternatives be but uh, it was just basically thrown in so that was as close to getting rule involvement I ever got to and so um, as a matter of interest when did you realise that you were like really good at the penalties the way they were previously what was the when did the penny drop that actually you could do because uh, you know obviously I think Davey would have taken penalties I think Damien Fitzhenry might have taken some penalties so it's not beyond yeah. it wasn't like the first time we'd ever seen goalkeepers taking penalties your particular style was unique but when did you start doing that? Um, it was actually like in the club field you know you kind of mess about and throwing it in like and uh, then it just became a consistency and I started doing it for the club and then all of a sudden I found out before we played Wexford in the um, backdoor system in uh, 12 I think 12 when I was first in that uh, they came up to me, um, Jerk Onion came up to me inside in Torless in Dundrum House, sorry, actually, and told me I was taking the penalties that day. So that was my first inclination. I was going to be taking them for Cork. And that day we ironically got one and uh, I scored it and then it kind of went on from there. But there's more messing about in the club field and stuff like that. And then it came to the stage where no one was standing for a few. So it became a thing that I started taking them for the club fully then and stuff and just kept doing it. But like I, I spoke about this many a time where I fell in my arse trying a few as well. Like, you know, um, so it's not that they were all success, but. Um, but like I had actually heard over the winter that TJ Reid the winter it was taken out that TJ Reid and Tony Kelly had it perfected as well Right. so ironically I think I was going to be the one that was going to get the slitter into the throat so uh, <laughs> I might have been better off I might have been better off with the rule change going the way it went um, in the long run but yeah it was just trial and error at home my father kind of got me to do them as well like and always kind of supported me to try it and stuff and then carried into one or two games for the club and went on from there Did you get better and better at it as, as time went on? Throw it a little bit further, yeah. It wasn't a bit. It wouldn't have been as far in as I finished it out, like. But like I used to look back at videos in, like of um, I used to look back at. Oh, the lines just dropped there. So we're rejoined now by Anthony Nash. The line just dropped yeah. there, um, Anthony. You can tell us about that in a second. You were saying you were looking at yeah. videos. You were looking back at videos. Um... Yeah, videos. DJ Carey, I suppose, would have been one that I would have looked at, um, and seen the way he carried it in, like, like he was so skillful, like and. You know, his hand-eye coordination, as we all know, was just incredible. Like, and he would have carried the ball a long way. And Davy Fitz would have flicked it in more. I would have kind of, I'd have thrown it obviously higher in as well. But I didn't delay the ball in the hurley, you know, an awful lot either. Like, it wasn't that I was delaying it. But I, um, but it was just a flick. And uh, it was just my big thing was the pick. Once the pick went right, after after Royal Lane, I was just making sure I got to the point of contact. And like, a lot of my miss hits went in as well because goalkeepers were probably on the back foot expecting me to hit them well all the time, you know. So, um, and unfortunately, I hit one or two players right that might have you know, hurt them temporarily. I don't think I ever badly hurt anyone. Um, but I suppose the fear eventually came in where fellas were on the back foot and a couple of dribblers squeaked in. <laughs> <laughs> they started charging them down as well. That was the other thing that happened and I don't know how legal oh, that is. Yeah. Like, in fairness, it, like that was the funny thing in 13. So, uh, Patrick Kelly ran out and blocked one and I said it to, to I think it was um, Brian Gavin at the time, I said, he can't do that. Like, you know, that's, that's illegal. And he allowed the first time but then in the second half he didn't spoke to him said, you actually can't charge them down. So I think there was an awful lot of confusion and everything going on and was they breaking the rule or not breaking the rules. I think the easiest thing then was for the GA just to come in and go, right, let's put a stop to this um, because like then it was going to come to the stage of, well, if I'm allowed to be charged down from my flick, was Patrick Horgan taking an armor free allowed to be charged down? I think the easiest thing then was just put it to bed and just say, look, this is it, one-on-one -on -one penalty, don't break the line. Um, so I wonder was there a bit of that and then they, they, they actually went out like and a couple of people that were involved in my teams before actually wrote articles to try and get rid of it <laughs> which was funny um, and uh, but then it just went out with the past in like that was it then and we, we got the new rules in. Um, I, not many people have names uh, have rules named after them so that was uh, you know on your career list of achievements yeah they had to, they had to name a rule after me yeah, yeah, yeah. It's you know it was like as I said we were fortunate with Patrick Horgan we actually scored a good few in the following year um, but I got a few texts and tweets after the All-Ireland final at 14. I think Kilkenny pulled two or three of the Tipperary lads down and they saved their penalties then, you know, because the very first year, if people remember, they went to uh, still three on the line, but you had to be outside the 21. And I think Kilkenny saved one or two penalties and I got woeful abuse on Twitter, <laughs> you know, for for uh, causing the loss in the final. Like, you know, I think Tipperary missed one or two in the final. Um, but I was kind of saying I didn't make the rule, like, you know, but yeah. uh, I, got, I got a few interesting tweets, all right? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, well... There's no accounter for some people, it turns out, especially on social media. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Why why did the, the line drop there, Anthony? Do you want to explain that one for yeah. us? Yeah, funny. Uh, so I, I was actually ringing Sean Toomey there. So we have the final, the, the fifth final tomorrow and you well, just making sure, ringing around, um, making sure everybody's okay after last night. So he was trying to ring, ring back in there. No? So you should actually, 
you know, feel feel privileged that I'm hanging up with one of the players to, to stay in the line 24 hours before we play a final. So uh, it just cut out the call there, cut out the zoom, then. But uh, yeah, we had a good win last night against Waterford. So finally getting out tomorrow against NUAG. How are your nerves now as somebody who has influence but not as much as you might have done previously? It's scary, the difference. Like, you've no control. And you've no control with the standing on the sideline either because, like, we have to stay within a certain perimeter. Like, and I am one of those coaches that I would walk 21 to 21. I'd never encroach and in, inhibit in the game, but I want to be having, you know, a say in what's going on. Like, and it's just the one thing for a young coach. Like, you know, I'm, I'm still learning very, very much on the sideline that, I just can't have as much input as uh, as I'd like to have, you know, when you're playing in goals. So my two years or so liberties, I was coaching, but I was also playing, so I still had an influence in the game. When you're standing on the sideline, like, you're handing over your trust to the players, like, you know, and they're a super bunch of lads, but, like, it's so easy standing on the sideline and watch the game and see the mistakes when you're not fully involved in it. But you do want to get your influence in, like, and uh, it's an impossibility to get all the messages in, but... So I am one of the coaches that's not good on the sideline. My stomach was sick. Like everyone's going to the dressing room after. All the players are in their haunches last night. And I was the worst one of them. <laughs> the, the, the physio came over to me, the poor lady, and she was like, are you all right? And I was drained. I was absolutely drained. Um, but that's a part of my learning curve where I have to step back. And, you know, it just shows the importance of having a team drilled and well drilled. that You can just hand it over to them on the day, you know. Well, that, that brings us nicely to that whole uh, having somebody standing behind the goal. Like Dave, yeah. we had... Like uh, when, we, when the conversation came up, the, the immediate aftermath, there was a general sense like, are you really telling your goalkeeper what to do with every ball? Like, is he not going to turn around to you and tell you, shut up, leave me alone. I, like, I have to let this play develop myself. Or is it actually just beneficial very early on in a, in a new relationship where you go, look, this is what we're thinking of here. What are you seeing? I, I, yeah, yeah. My, my piece with the 42 actually this week, so I wrote an article on this. Like, like everyone's, I think like, look, Davy is the kind of Davy is the kind of character that people love to talk about, and I know he creates his own, you know, uh, headlines as well. And I think, again, I spoke about Galway going to Leinster. It's great to have him in the game, and I'm always, you know, it's always great to have a character like that within the sport because you know he's a great, um, a great, you know, person that like, he gets people talking. He's like Marmite, you either love him or you don't like him. You know what I mean? And uh, I, I, I think I can kind of so my 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 example of this right was. So I used to go in at half time and I used to ask the statsman for where my puck outs went because like there was one game where I think we had 14 puck outs in the first half and I realised at half time that 12 of them went down the same wing. Now, during that match, I, I it never registered with me that I was going down the same wing or anything like that. Um, you know, but at half time I kind of went, oh Jesus, right. But each time it felt like the right option. So it kind of steadied my head to know, okay, right, I need to change this up, whatever like that. On a flip occasion of that, I remember a member of management ran into me one day and told us and things weren't going so well. I'm going to save you the expletives now, right? So he ran into me and said, we're after losing seven out of the last nine puck outs and ran away. And I called him back and I said, what in the F do you want me to do? So like, stop pucking out the ball. Have you an answer for me, basically? Like, you know, so how the messages are delivered are one thing. Like, we don't know what Davies fella is doing. Is he telling him where to puck the ball? If that's the case you'd want a very kind of obeying goalkeeper that's going to do what she's told. Or is he telling him, look, we're after losing the last three down the right wing, maybe spray it. Or is he telling the goalie to get messages out to the backs? You're not loading approach in the field anymore. The goalie is able to move out around the field when there's a break of play and get the messages across. So I don't think we'll ever be privy to the information, but it depends on what it is as well, you know? Yeah, exactly. I, 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 I can't imagine that... Uh, Davy wants full control over every single because it, it's no. it's not going to be repeatable down the line. You, you, you no, know you're no. you're building a habit that's a wrong habit that won't be repeatable. Yeah, yeah because I, 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 my thing is, and I joked in the, in the thing as well. What happens like when they're playing Tipperary and Turles? Sure, all the Tipperary fans are going to surround around this guy for a crack. Like you know, <laughs> these messages won't be getting in anywhere. Like um, I think it's just a message to you know maybe getting messages in. I don't think it is a, is a, it is a you know a play for play message. Um, I'd be very doubtful of that, um, you know. And as you said, like you're creating a habit that just isn't there. There's no point giving someone, you know, a bad habit. It's like a driving lesson. It's very hard to get out of the system then. So I think, look, maybe it's Davey saying, look, we don't have enough way of getting messages onto the pitch, you know, or what's the story. But uh, again, it goes back to my original point there of me. I, like I, I'm very frustrated on the sideline, not being able to have the control I have. But then I have to relinquish it and say, look, I'm not a player anymore. I've only got so much that I can dictate in the game. But um but again, look, I go back to it, and it's great to be talking about something about hurling again, like, you know. What type of a coach are you? And, and how are you uh, improving all the time as a coach? Uh, on the field, I'm very much into structures and hands-on and just, you know what, making players happy. Um, 
you know, I think a lot of this stuff is is the top uh, few inches in the head, like, you know. Um, encouragement, I think, is the big thing that I'd like to bring because I, I look, uh, you know, Jimmy Barry Murphy made me 10 feet tall going onto the pitch and it could have been only a one-line sentence that just got me feeling good about myself. Um, 17, we tried something new with puck outs and Pat Ryan made me feel that I was, you know, that I had the freedom to do whatever I wanted and I thought if puck outs wise it was my best year. Um, so it's just allowing freedom and I think it's just understanding that a player you know, that a player is an individual. Like, you've got 35, six fellas inside the dressing room. You can't have a one-for-all blanket on them. But I'd be much into enjoyment, a lot of hurling, and just structure, just in creating, like, realising that, you know, players are created from different scenarios. So, like, in a game of hurling and inter-county hurling, 70 minutes, you've potentially got 60, 70 puckouts. So get them right, and you're a long way to winning the game, you know. Um, and then it's just the last message you always say to them, look, enjoy it, go out and play with your freedom, because we play hurling to play hurling. You know, we'd play hurling. We don't play hurling to be robotic. Uh, we all play the game to get on the ball. Um, so I'd hope that I'd be a positive in it as well. Uh, Sideline wise, I'm very, I'm learning an awful lot. Like you know, people will keep on about the incident with Keen Lynch and myself last year and stuff like that. And fortunately, we had a conversation after that thing as well that I didn't see the incident. And uh, when I turned around, I heard and my initial reaction as an immature coach was to run in and you know ask the referee what the hell that was about. You know what I mean? So. Um, but that's just like I'm going to make loads of mistakes, like I did as a player as well. And and you know the funny thing is, is I don't know do I want to continue on and stay as a coach either. I love this now having a conversation with you when I talk about hurling 24 seven, because I do love the game, but it's very time consuming and it's very energy. You know, a lot of energy is expelled on it in as well, like you know. Um, but I'm enjoying it for now, yeah. Uh, there's a lot to uh, to get into there. So what would what? Why do you think you might not? It's too intense. Yeah, I find like. To be honest, right, you, like I'm very lucky. So this year I went into the twenties with Cork uh, with Ben and Ronan. So Ben Car- Ben O'Connor and Ronan Cornyn. I got to know Ger and and Terence that are inside there as well. But the reason I went in was the relationship I had with Ben and Ronan. Like so, it's a friendship. It's fun. You know what I mean? And uh, I get on very well with the lads. And that was my main reason. If they rang me to the Cork under fourteens, it would have been the same thing. Um, but again, it's a lot of you know, it's a lot of time. Like you know, you're never switched off really. And that's why I say inter county management at the highest level is very difficult. Like it's a full time job. It is, it, and no one can tell you otherwise. At no stage will any manager switch off for a day um, while the season is on. So it's just the timing of it. Um, you know, I'd like to stay involved in the game somehow. Uh, I, I love golf as well. I'm trying to play the world of golf. Um, played this morning and played absolutely shite, but I still enjoyed it. <laughs> so it's just trying to balance balance the life there as well. Um, but like, I do love it, and I'm just kind of it's. But it is an awful lot of energy because I do when I'm involved, I'm very involved. It feels a little bit like your generation of goalkeepers who kind of got under the hood of the puck outs have a little bit of an advantage when it comes to uh, the evolution of the game. Now, loads of people have caught up, obviously, and there's loads of great mm. people who weren't goalkeepers or, or weren't working in that era. But like that's mm. the that's the birth of uh, proper tactical evolution. And mm. it kind of it was a quantum leap forward, really, in the period that yeah. you were playing. So. Um, I can I can see why the attraction is to like to do it now while that's all still yeah. fresh and you still kind of feel like that you're building on a layer of stuff that's incredibly up to date. Yeah, well, I worked. I was very lucky to work with Sean O'Donnell originally with Cork and built up a good friendship with him as well. Like, and he's now the um, head statistician for Limerick hurling and football. I think in football as well, but he's definitely with the hurling. And uh, we had a good relationship. But I like that side of the game. You know, I'd be kind of geeky when it comes to that. Like. Um, I do like hearing about stats. I don't ever overburden my teams with stats. I like to hear them myself and see if there's something I can do to put it into practice without having to give them the the boring side of it. You know what I mean? Like, it's all grand me telling you we've had 10 wides, but like, where did they come from and why did they come from there? And were they the right option? Well, that's up to me as a part of the management team to break that down and say, look, maybe it's just we need to use extra pass or whatever. But I enjoy it. Like, it's not, you know, I, I'm really into, like, you know, technology and golf. I'm into that kind of stuff. Um, really exciting guy, as, I, as I'm describing myself here. <laughs> but I, uh, I I enjoy it. So, yeah, I, I don't mind that side of it then. Like, you know, and that's what I'm saying when it comes to training, that I, I don't mind, uh, you know, having coaches coach. And I just do a bit of structure and stuff like that because I just see a huge importance. Of it, like, you know? in, in 17, you said you had a, a different approach to puck outs and, mm-hmm. and more freedom with them. What was the difference? So, Hoggy always had a joke at me, right? That if puck outs, so his statement for me was, if it if long isn't working, go longer. So I used to just love to belt the ball, like, you know, because as any goalkeeper, you're trying to get it as far. And people in the, he used to always like me, the people in the crowd, she's any great puck of a ball. And then Pat came in and realized that by us doing that, we weren't naturally big. We weren't naturally massive ball winners. We needed to try something else. So he wanted me to shorten it and lower the height. 
So we had a rule that the puck goods would probably land around the 65 of the opposition, you know, and maybe skim through whatever like that. But if the option was on to go and try and ping a guy 65 yards from the opposition's goal, then I had the freedom to do that. So the first session he said it to me, I said, Pat, I can't do this. I said, I've never done He said, you can do it. I've seen you play. And he, he, he kind of said to me, look, I've seen the way you strike the ball. You can do this. So we spent the whole winter just working on it. And then, um, you know, eventually Derek McGrath spoke in the dressing room once to me. We played Watford in the Munster Championship. And he came into the dressing room and said, look, he beat us well done. And we spent too much time trying to analyse Anthony's puck outs. You know, so teams were at the stage in 17 where they were analysing our puck outs inside out because they were going so well. But I had gotten the confidence where Pat said to me, look, you have the freedom to make mistakes. So instead of going long and long and long, I decided, look, we need to mix it up here. We're not a naturally gifted ball winning team. Um, and by God, did I make a lot of mistakes? Like, don't get me wrong, but it was more enjoyable, and I had a huge freedom from the players and the management to to allow me do that. I remember being behind the goals one time when the Dubs were playing and watching the runs that particularly Paul yeah. Flynn would make, where he would he would kind of get the ball into it. Would, it sometimes it would bounce into his chest from the kick out. He was in so yeah. much acres of space, and he'd started his run like three and a half, four seconds. It was like a wide receiver, and. Um, Obviously, that comes from hours and hours and hours and hours of practice. Are you looking for runs in in, in, in yeah. seventeen in particular? Are you looking for somebody who makes the run and you know where it's going to go because you've 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 practiced skimming it? Yeah, yeah. Basically, like what I found myself from watching videos back was, I always went for the first runner originally. So if you made a good run out the wing, you were my target. I wasn't watching the fact, and I, I spoke about this when he retired. Brendan Matter read me so well in a couple of games, like. You know, he'd look behind him the first run and next thing all of a sudden he'd error towards that side. So what he developed in 17 was the first run might be the best one to delay it the second and then maybe hit the second one. But I was looking for space in 17 and the 18 and 19, wherever like that, the older I got, rather than in 14 and 13 where I was just looking to hit it as long as I could down on top of the fella. Um, now, which it worked as well at times, like we two very good years there and it suited our team, like we the likes of Pat Ronan, who was a very good ball winner then. But we just need, Pat felt we needed that change for the team um, and that we had to change it up. So I was looking more for space and movement in as I got older yeah, and uh, just trusted myself a little bit more. And I said, look, like in 19 in the second half against Kilkenny, our puck was broke down, like, you know, and they just destroyed us. Like, so like there were many an occasion where these didn't go well, like, you know, but we felt it was the best thing for the team to be a success. And could you ever pinpoint why they would break down in a game like that? Uh, we kind of had a few structured plays, all right, that I suppose cross wires and then like I committed to a few of the runs that weren't made in the right time when I should have had the maturity to maybe stand up and say, look, okay, that run wasn't made in the perfect spot. Delay it and go again another way, you know. So a lot of the times, I think I've never watched the game back, but I'd say I hit a lot of puck outs to Kilkenny fell running onto it in his own. Um, and in fairness to Hoggy, he'd put in an individual performance that day to keep us in it. Uh, he got 310 or something like that. So it was just a pity, like, you know, it was a tough winter for me now going over that winter result because I would have taken a lot of the blame on my own shoulders there as well, like, you know. Um... But sometimes it can be runs and sometimes it can be just, you know, a goalkeeper having a bad day. Like, but like I would have looked at Dublin's kickouts. I would have, I, you know, I would have really looked at Cluxton as a as a motivator there as well for me to have the, the bravery to go and try these things. Like, you know, um, and the willingness of the Dublin outfielders to make those runs as well to give him that. But his natural ability was, uh, his skill set was incredible. Like, you know, and uh, I remember a few people kind of would have said, my puckouts were trying to emulate his in football. Like, you know, I know you could never do it in hurling football, but... Like I wanted to try and achieve something that he was trying to do, that he was doing, you know, on a consistent basis. Yeah, I, can you practice those? Do you need to practice those with the individuals who will be making the runs? And that's difficult because you can you need basically five or six of them simultaneously to mimic yeah. the game conditions. Yeah, it's very hard because, like, it was a stage there where I get Mark O'Donnell. He's the one of the Masors with the Cork team. He used, he used to be the target for my puckouts because he used to do triathlons and he was exceptionally fit. <laughs> so eventually we got him to tug out and uh, he had to come up to me at one stage and say, look, is it okay if I just touch the hurley and not catch them? Because <laughs> his hands were getting reddened. But uh, he used to be so willing for me to come to training and practice runs, you know. And in before training, what I'd do is if anybody came out for a puck, I'd be out there first and I'd have 100, 200 puckouts taken before training. And uh, you'd get, let's say, Dara Fitzgibbon for 10 he'd be gassed out then he'd go out doing a shooting but I'd have 10 done with him and Luke Mead would come out and I'd do the same you know um, so it was a lot of my practice for puck was before training and catching individuals just creating the runs you know uh, but it was just reps and reps and reps and uh, I'll never forget Mark Mark used to turn up in gloves in the winter because his hands used to be so sore from the, the hard splitters um, but it was just for me it was repetition and repetition all the time to get the confidence up Yeah it's uh, it's funny because it's it ultimately is, is kind of the physical repetition is massively important, but as you've already alluded to, the top two inches, the psych, the psychology of like 
knowing when to hold him and when to fold him. A big time. Like I would have leaned an awful lot on Gary Keegan that year as well. So with Gary in with us, like, and I, I spoke about how good he is, you know, and uh, I wasn't in sports psychology in any manner or means before he came in. Uh, completely embraced it with him. And then he, you know, he just helped me to work through a few things during games, like, you know, because as a goalkeeper, you've time to think. There's people listening in here now, we'd be sick of me talking about that and stuff. And like, as a goalkeeper, you have far more time in a game. Like, and I just keep myself busy by talking to the defenders and stuff like that, you know, just keeping them on their toes. Um, and basically just kind of making sure that they were they were switched on as well because I had the energy to do so. But, uh, but psychology at the end of it would have come in to me where I was like, look, this is the right thing for the team, do it. And you know what? Like a lot of puckers didn't go my way. And like I had an example at Parky Ring once where I hit a good good puck out to a wing back who hand passed it to a midfielder who then hand passed it to a wing forward who put it wide and a fella from the crowd roared down. Expletives again now, so I'll cover him over and goes, for Christ's sake, Nash, will you ever puck the ball long? No, four players had gone by like before your man put it wide you know but it was the right thing for the team and we created a scoring opportunity but it was just uh, you know have the guts and the bravery to, to think that you're doing the right thing for your team you know yeah the other thing is you get to hear too much from the crowd as a goalkeeper as well that yeah. maybe some of the midfielders never yeah. get to hear that's that's for another day's occasion for maybe a late night show right that we could kind of you could ah oh, there's some ah oh, brilliant stories like you know some very funny ones like and especially I love the Cork support like um, but you know it the the, the, the comments that have come towards you like but you know I'd say if you've got a camera zoomed in on me a few times you'd see a right smile like underneath it after the abuse I was after getting but I learned to to just uh, get on with it like you know We'll uh, save that for the road shows um, Yeah yeah, when, yeah, yeah, brilliant yeah. <laughs> when we can edit them out for afterwards One last thing there's um, um, a bunch of new players coming through and a bunch of old players who are putting up massive scores in the second round of the league uh, the history of the league is, is littered with lads who had like a, a 2-10 game or a 2-12 game and then mm-hmm. come championship we didn't actually see them but it mm-hmm. feels like maybe there's a little bit of a difference uh, with mm-hmm. Michal Houlihan who, who's not a kid at Limerick and if they were to have another he- heavy scoring forward well it's a bit hard on Globetrotters at this stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, in fairness to him, no, we played against him with Kilmallock two years ago now, I think, with So Liberties, and he's a good player, like, you know, and, like, has the height, obviously has the has the tradition with, with you know, the Hula name. Um, and if, for a guy of his size, very accurate, like, you know, a free taker as well, well able to hurl. Um, and what I find with Limerick, like, you know, I'm not privy to anything. I know Barry's ever, I never do ask. But like, they seem to bed these guys in for a year. So he's been there last year. We wouldn't have seen an awful lot of him. You know, he'd obviously been taking part of a lot of intense training games and, you know, building up the body and stuff like that. And then John has just thrown him in now to to give him that experience and shown that he is capable. Like, so I think they're very good. Because, and look, you said it there a second ago. They don't need to blood these guys in straight away. They can give him a year to bed into, into county hurling, see if he's good enough. They obviously see with in-house games and stuff and challenge matches that he is. Didn't give him the league. So that's the next step up. And he showed the last day that he's well able to play. Like, and the one thing that they'll be most pleased about is that, and I think Limerick are always kind of the epitomising of this is, is the ethic, the work ethic, the honesty that he gave on top of having the skill as well. Um, and I suppose it's always like, you mightn't see this guy in championship. If Ger- if Gerard Hegarty and Tom Morrissey go on to have the games they have, if Keen Lynch is coming back in, you've got Kyle Hayes moving back, you've got Cahill O'Neill, like you, you, like, you might never see him, but they know if they need him that he's there. And I think that's the biggest key there, like because he does fill that kind of a gauge of... Uh, of the Tom Morrissey's and the Grode Hegarty's where he's big, he's physically strong, he can move and on top of it, he's actually an exceptional hurler. So I think, uh, you know, it'll be down to injuries maybe or, you know, fatigue or whatever that we might get to see him um, because you said, look, the, the pick they have up front at the moment with Keane coming back is frightening. But uh, but I'd say that's basically what's happened. They've given him the year. He's developed very well, bought into the bought into the camp and is well able to play. Ready to go. Yeah, Bubbles uh, mm. retired this week as well. That was the mm. last thing I just wanted to, to get your yeah. thoughts on. You would have come up against him a good few times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, exceptional. The man probably has one of the best set of wrists I've ever seen. Like, you know, um, I smile and think about him because I think, like, and people are going to go, oh, he's not about himself. Like, he pulled in a ball in 18 or 19 and I made a save and I probably would go down and say it's probably the best save I've ever made. But, like, I wonder how many other people on the field would have pulled in the ball with the venom that he did it with. Like, the ball bounced and he just pulled in it. And I don't know, look, people ask, I don't know what the hell I did to get there. But his wrists were just incredible, like, you know. And I know, I know over time, fitness might have come in against him. But, like, his record in finals, his skill levels, his, he's just a guy you'd like to watch. You know, I didn't like to watch him against me. <laughs> don't get me wrong. But uh, I did like to watch him play. Um, you know, I thought, Owen oh, Kelly-esque, like, you know, I could put a ball over the bar from any angle and stuff like that. And, you know, it's a pity. You know, I was wondering would Liam Cal get him back in, 
um, because a bit of experience there and a guy of his ability, natural ability and everything like that. But just his wrists, like he could, you know, there was a funny, we had a fellow Shane Walsh in college and he used to see and he saw always say it and I put, I put bubbles in this as well. He used to always say, Owen Kelly, you couldn't hook him in a phone box. You know, he does wrists so good, like, and I think bubbles can go into that category as well. That's high praise. Anthony, great to have you with us again. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks, William. Thanks, sir. Thanks.